So in 2020, you're gonna see me do a, a change, a pivot in my YouTube strategy. You're gonna see me make videos that are made, that are more me, that are content driven, that are teaching, that are educational. You're gonna see me do a lot of training around the conversion topic, copywriting funnels, conversion, because I love that stuff. And you'll see how Learn's channel, once we revive that and get that going up, it's gonna probably have a very different strategy than the Onyx and Gold channel. This is The Fighting Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to entrepreneurs looking to change the world. Learn how to start, build, and scale a business in today's highly competitive business environment. Here's your host, The Fighting Entrepreneur, Anik Singhal. What's up, you crazy fighting entrepreneurs? Guess who it is? It's your favorite person in the whole wide world. Um, so this is actually the first episode that I'm filming in 2020. How cool is that? So today's episode is titled, One Year Later, Is YouTube Organic Worth It? Haha, -ha, yes, we're gonna do some deep diving and talk about what I've learned with YouTube and what I plan on doing moving forward this year because there's gonna be some big fundamental changes from the way we've been running it. All right, but before I do that, come on. Are you a part of this revolution we're creating here at Learn or not? You gotta go to learn.com, L-U-R-N.com and sign up, join. Get your free account. We have so many amazing free courses from topics about copywriting, topics like YouTube ads and Facebook ads and business, uh, business building, e-com, email. We got free courses. We've got some courses that are like seven bucks, 20 bucks, and we've got entire academies where we'll support you and coach you. All right, so it's up to you, but you gotta get engaged. You gotta be a part of the community. We have so many amazing features coming out this year. You're gonna love it. It's free. Go to lurn.com, join right now, okay? All right, so make that happen. So now let's talk about YouTube and uh, what our feelings are about it, what I've learned from it, what I'm gonna do with it, am I gonna do anything with it? So we started YouTube now about a year ago, all right? So I have of course been on YouTube before that for quite some time and I had done things. The biggest things I had used YouTube for in the past was to run these massive webinars. I would use uh, Google Hangout, right, through YouTube. And so, I had never really done active video submissions or any kind of community building, channel building. I had just run these webinars and somehow I had managed to get, I think a little north of 20,000 subscribers, maybe 22, 23,000 subscribers, but I never did anything with them. So then comes 2019, early 2019, and we decide we wanna conquer the social media world. Now you've heard me already during my predictions part talk about how social media has completely changed. And this whole idea of blitz it with free content and you know you can dominate the world, I don't really see that playing out anymore. Uh, but all of these networks are creating a pay to play environment. And so I'm changing my social media strategy. However, YouTube for organic growth is still not really a pay to play environment. This is getting interesting, so listen to me. However, it's getting really difficult. And the reason it's getting super difficult is because, again, it's a supply and demand issue. We've got the younger generations now that f prefer YouTube way over things like Facebook, that are creating YouTube channels left and right, that are active on YouTube, all right? And so you have a user versus number of videos issue, right? And so this is the same reason why people complain on Facebook, you don't get your ads or you don't get your social media posts seen much because they just don't have enough news feed. They don't have enough users. They don't have enough displays. You average person has hundreds of friends. How many things can they actually show you? So it becomes a pay to play environment. YouTube's not quite there yet, but it is getting harder and harder to grab those organic views. YouTube also works like a channel, subscriber base, right? So I remember when I was watching the TV show Lost, right? I knew that every Thursday night at whatever, 8 p.m. or whatever, that show would air. Thursday night, 8 p.m., I waited. I mean, we had friends come over, we'd order food, you know, we had chosen our seats on the couch, we were waiting for the show to start. And that type of mentality is what's really I'm seeing play out on YouTube. So a year later, here's what we were able to do. We grew our channel from whatever, let's say about 22,000 to now almost 50,000. It's like any day now, we'll hit 50,000. So we more than doubled our subscriber base, which is awesome, that's great. Super excited about that. But I'm not that excited about the number of views my videos get. And has that really grown from what it was doing a year ago? And not really. 
not by a lot. I mean, I'll turn to the experts here who are filming the video. Stuart, you tell me. Has the organic views that we're getting grown a lot from a year ago when we had 22,000 or 25,000 no, subscribers? It's not been parallel with the numbers. With the growth, right? So it's not been, yeah, so what he just said is it's not been parallel. So yeah, maybe it's grown, but if we doubled our channel, we definitely didn't double the number of organic views we're getting on the videos I post up. Part of that has to do with the fact that everyone's jumping on a YouTube bandwagon now, so organic reach will drop. But another part of that has to do more with, I believe, on my perspective, a failed YouTube strategy. All right. And hold on. That's a little drastic. Not failed. All right. Because we're, some big wins in 2019 that I'll share with you. Um, that is why I'm not just going to continue YouTube in 2020, but I'm probably going to put even more focus on it. But my whole strategy will be very different. OK, so it wasn't a failed strategy. It was my own approach of content. All content is created equal is kind of the approach I took with YouTube and it doesn't work. So for the most part in 2019, my content focus was my podcast, right? We got to a place where we were doing three episodes a week. Now we've pulled back from that. That was too much for me. Now we're doing one good episode a week and it's been great. Uh, it's actually also helped our podcast. I mean, it's keeping its rankings. It's still doing really well. I think people can listen to one a week more than they can listen to three a week. And so we were, of course, we'd film this podcast episode, we'd pop it up on YouTube. So that was three, uh, three videos a week we were putting on YouTube. And our goal was to get to seven, but I didn't have the time to film four more videos for YouTube. That's a lot of content. I just didn't have the time for it. So what were we doing? Well, we had a great team here of our, our audio visual experts. They were going through all of my content, all my past things, my past pod podcast episodes, and pulling segments, little video clips, and putting them on YouTube. So I call that living in the environment where all content is created equal. And that is not the case with YouTube. Look, you will get out of your content on YouTube what you put in. So the idea of just taking snippets of pre-existing content and dumping it up on YouTube, yeah, of course it works. I mean, look, I can still put up videos and get three, four, five, six hundred views for free for a video. I'm not gonna take, that's, that's really good eyeballs. Remember, a view on YouTube has watched you for many seconds and a lot of them, the, the engagement, the average length of watch time on my channel right now, and this is across tens of thousands of video views that are happening per month, is over 10 minutes. That's ridiculous, right? So if I can even post a snippet video, that five random minutes of me talking at an onstage event, and get, let's say 500 views, 500 times 10, which is 10 minutes average, is it's 5,000. That's 5,000 minutes of someone, of, of people's attention. And it was just, regurgitated content. So when you look at it that way, you're like, wow, that, that's not bad at all. Well, I'll take that all day. And so, yes, that's why we continued to do YouTube the way it was going for a while. But this is where that kind of strategy scares me long term. And that is that YouTube determines the worth and value of your channel based on your user's engagement. So right now, YouTube probably doesn't love my channel. They like it, they don't love it, because they see that if I post a video with almost 50,000 subscribers, it'll get about 500 views over the course of the next, you know, first day or two. And for them, they have other channels where they're like, man, we can get like a lot larger engagement. And the reason for that is because over time, users know that I'm not making a video for YouTube. They pick that up. They're not watching as much. They're not as engaged into my videos. And so all in all, the point I'm saying here is that if you want to do, if you want to kill YouTube, you want to crush it, you make videos for YouTube. You don't take regurgitated content. You can sometimes mix in regurgitated content, but from all my friends now that I've talked to that are doing really well with YouTube organic, I have come to learn that you have to do a YouTube video for YouTube. Now, having said that, you just have to expect now and accept now that the organic views you get will be far lower than what it was two, three years ago. Supply and demand, economics 101, okay? But I wanna go through with you three strategies that I've learned, the three ways you can actually work with YouTube. So, but before I do that, and, and then I'll lead into what I'm going to do in 2020, what my strategy for me, this doesn't mean it has to be your strategy, but this is what it's going to be for me. So to recap, 2019, we doubled our subscriber base, which is awesome. Um, but I want to put some perspective in the time that we added 26, 27,000 subscribers to our YouTube channel through paid traffic. I probably brought it. I'm not even exaggerating. We probably brought in about 300,000 
email leads. That's worth a lot of money. I mean, 300,000 email leads for us was worth millions of dollars. So it's, and it took very little time of mine, if any, like it's just ads. So it gets, you know, where you're dealing that time versus investment versus, like you just think that through, you're like, oh man, I, I don't know if this is worth my time. So there was a moment where towards the end of 2019, I actually declared that we're not going to move forward with this in 2020. We have to really focus our time on revenue generating activities, key focus. You guys know I've been talking about focus, focus, focus a lot. I've been very open about how I'm realigning my focus over the last months. I've talked about this. However, then we did something interesting. In November, mid-November, we ran a test campaign. This is when I started testing my predictions that I made at the end of December for 2020. And we ran, and we did a whole campaign where we tested it just on YouTube. And we were going after warm audiences only. So this was like list uploads and people that have engaged with my channel, with my videos, and et cetera, et cetera. And something big comes out of that. And what we discovered was that the ads that we are running to channel followers and video watchers, my cost per acquisition was less than half, far. It was almost 30 to 40% of what I was getting when I was targeting like my warmer audiences. So let's compare two audiences. I've uploaded a list audience into YouTube, which is like my email list. I upload that into YouTube. It's a warm audience. These are people that know me. They've opted in for me. And then I run an ad to that audience and I run the exact same ad to a, a smaller audience, but an audience on YouTube that has watched one of my videos or is a subscriber to my channel. If I'm paying $5 a lead for the list upload, I would be paying $2 a lead for the channel watchers and engagers. That, ladies and gentlemen, completely changed my perspective. So right around the time I made an announcement to the team, I was like, ah, oh, we're not gonna do YouTube anymore. That data comes back to me and I'm like, oh, we're doing YouTube again. <laughs> this is huge. So notice how, again, my prediction in, in 2020, right? I said, you, if you want to win in social media and in organic, you're going to have to have some level of paid. And so the reason I'm going to be doing YouTube now isn't necessarily all the money and the views I'm going to get from every video I put up, but it's because I want to keep building up that warm audience, this hot audience that just loves me and loves my videos. And that way I'm dropping my acquisition cost on the paid traffic. So it's a double dip benefit. Now, what, what was the other thing I learned in 2019? The other thing I learned, like, which I shared with you was like, there's no reason to put seven videos a week up, especially if they're just little clips from different things. It's just not, it, it's just not, it didn't pan out, right? Like we could do it better. Like, is it, Hey, I'm glad we did it. Of course, I'm glad we did it. But you have to think about the amount of time it takes of my team, right? You've got someone shifting through old content. You've got them snipping it out. You got them editing it, you got to upload it. So is it really worth that time? And I don't know. I, once I got done with my research, I felt like, no, I've discovered there are three essential strategies on YouTube that people are using. And I'm going to go through those right now and tell you which one I'm going to you know, I'm going to go into, uh, and I really want to give Fred Lamb credit here. So I don't want to act like this was my own epiphany or discovery. Fred is the one that got on the phone with me and, and really worked this through with me in I think early December. So Fred, thank you, man. All right. So number one is a vlogger. A vlogger is the person you see all the jump cuts and they do random topics and they're fun and they're out there and having a good time and they show you behind the scenes in their life. They pull pranks on people. They talk about random things. Star Wars movie came out. They talk about Star Wars. They, they just whatever mainstream, whatever. They just talk about, you know, it's, it's a, you know, I, I call it the Truman show. Like you just, you know, if anyone of you have ever seen that movie, it's just like you get a glimpse into their life. It's entertainment. Really, so there, there's a key, it's entertainment. Their idea, or most vloggers are looking to monetize through just getting a ton of views and then, you know, whatever AdSense revenue, YouTube sense, but you'll never see a vlogger say, hey, go to my opt-in page and opt-in and, you know, I'll sell you stuff through email, like, so vlogging. Okay, as I talked about it, or as I learned about it from Fred, I was like, yeah, definitely not me. I'm not a vlogger, um, you know, I don't do stories, I don't like being followed around with video cameras and I, I just don't, I don't wanna do any of that, that's not me. So out the door. Okay. Number two is what I tried to do in 2019. 
because that's just what I thought was best. If you remember, you can go back through my podcast episodes, you'll know that I interviewed an individual by the name of Dan Locke. And that was when we really kicked off our YouTube strategy. So we were gonna, we were gonna emulate the success of Dan Locke, right? And here's why we didn't emulate the success of Dan Locke. First, Dan Locke makes videos for YouTube. Lots of thought goes into them, high production quality. He puts a lot, and you can listen to the interview, by the way. Go to onicpodcast.com and go just type in Dan Locke and you'll see his episode. And you'll see, I mean, they have a data analytics team, a research team, they put production time into it. He puts his own time into it, hours and hours of filming per week. And so it's a big channel for him. But his strategy is very different. So the second type of strategy you can do on YouTube is this like inspirational, just mainstream mass market. So four ways to get rich, uh, three things millionaires don't tell you, five lessons learned from Warren Buffett. Like these types of click baity, um, and not in a bad way, I just mean like they're, they're you know, they're, they're more mass appeal. So, but still you have to do the video for like for uh, YouTube, right? So you gotta talk to the audience, you gotta think through what YouTube wants, what YouTube audiences are going through, the platform that they're on, and really make those videos for YouTube. And that is the strategy where more regular videos help, so more is better, right? So if you could do three, four, five, six, seven a week, that's more nets you're catching. So for example, when Tesla launched their Cybertruck, and you know it was a big hoopla, and everyone was like, what the heck is this thing? And then it, the, the windshield broke or whatever, you know, someone following strategy number one might talk about their feelings about the Tesla truck, right? That's what they would, oh, here's what I think. Oh, it's stupid. Oh, it's ugly. Oh, I'm going to buy one or whatever. That's a vlogger. Someone following strategy two would probably talk about five marketing lessons from Elon Musk's 180,000 sales for, um, right? So that would be more like a Dan Locke. And you can actually probably, I bet you, I haven't checked it, but I bet you he did something about it. I bet you, because he's watching current trends. Why? Because it's, it's a net, right? So now he's gonna get a net of like these Tesla followers, people who like Tesla, who may not know who Dan Locke is, but they'll kind of come into the Dan Locke net. The next day he might make a video about Star Wars. And like, now he's got like the Star Wars people bring them into Dan Locke net and then other people, right? So great strategy a lot of work and you got to be you got to be interesting and you got to be up to speed on the time right so you can't even shoot these videos like 30 days before i mean you can shoot them maybe a few days before at all so it's, it's a lot of work and the type of audience it's bringing to you is much colder and so you have to spend a lot more time with them to warm them up to you so Obviously, more videos, more being in front of them, that helps a lot. And now that I'm seeing it a year later, I'm like, oh, it totally makes sense what Dan's doing and why it's working so well for him. But guess what? It's not for me. That's what I've discovered. It's, it's, it's too much work. It's too hard. And it's, it's got to be almost your core focus. Now, for Dan, if you talk to Dan or Dan's team, like he will tell you YouTube organic is, that's like their bread and butter. Like they, that is their core focus. It's just not, I don't see that being my core focus ever. It's just not something I would enjoy. So then the third strategy, and this is the one that I really, I stalked Fred Lamb for. I mean, you can go check his channel out. He does this really well. And that is what I call the educator, the teacher. So in that strategy, you're not going for mass appeal. You are specifically going for very warm audiences and you're gonna teach. Your videos are gonna be 20, 30, 40, 50, 60, 70 minutes long. And they're not just gonna be you talking with interesting, awesome sets and no, it's gonna be you, like it could be the most boring looking video with you in a TV screen or you in a laptop. And a lot of it may not even be you on the screen. It's like PowerPoints and scribble pad and showing stuff, but it's teaching. And I thought about this and I'm like, you know what's interesting? When I wanted to learn how to do YouTube ads, I went to YouTube and I found a couple of good channels and I binge watched for like a couple of hours. I had no problem watching videos that were 30, 40 minutes long because they were taking you step by step through how to do something. And so, and now I was really hot to that person. So the educator fits far more in alignment with who I am and what I do and what I enjoy. And you don't need to make nearly as many videos. The other big benefit of an educator strategy that I love is the long-term shelf life. The other person who I really looked at for the educator model who has just crushed it, continues to crush it, is Ritabon. 
anyone who knows my friend Rita Bansi, you can go to his channel, Flying Start Online, kills it. And he uses the educator model to, to build his YouTube channel. So you'll see, I mean, he, he went from zero to 100,000 subscribers. He's like taken over the whole India market for e-com training. Uh, and he's changed lives left and right by using the educator model, but that he doesn't post a video every day. But what's crazy is he tells me some of his most popular videos today are videos he filmed a year and a half ago. And that I love, I love that. But in strategy one and two, your videos will fall off a cliff because who's going to watch a video about cyber trucks launch now? It's, it's completely doesn't mean anything. But if I've posted an educator video, which is five ways to drop your click costs on Facebook ads, that's relevant a month ago, today, a month from now, and two months from now. So I like the idea of putting in the effort. So if someone tells me, hey, Anik, I need 30 minutes of your time, and I promise you, you're going to get 500 video views. I'll look at them and say, nope, sorry. My time is worth way more than that. Now, let's change the story. Someone comes to me and says, Anik, I need 30 minutes of your time. I will get you 100 video views per month for the next five years. Now, all of a sudden, I'm like, you know what? I'm in because the passive increasing gains is huge. If I can do that for a few months, back to back to back, then I will be at a point where I'm getting, you know, thousands of views organically over time. That's benefit number one. Benefit number two, which was what I really love, is that the people that are watching my stuff, the users I'm bringing in, are really targeted. Um, I'm not bringing in, you know, I'm not bringing in your Tesla follower who I now want to try to sell into, you know, marketing training or entrepreneurship training. Nope. I'm bringing to you, uh, like, if you watched my ad, if you watched my video about five ways to drop your Facebook ads cost. <laughs> Dude, you, you, you are in, you are, you are my prime target audience. You are my market, right? So that's a big, big part of it. It's not necessarily less work because for an educator video, you do need to put more effort into prep for the video, but it's a strategy that, I mean, look, my company's name is learn. It makes more sense. So in 2020, you're going to see me do a, a change, a pivot in my YouTube strategy. Um, you're going to see me make videos that are made, that are more me, that are content driven, that are teaching, that are educational. You're going to see me do a lot of training around the conversion topic, copywriting funnels, conversion, because I love that stuff. And you'll see how Learn, Learn's channel, once we revive that and get that going up, you know, at some point this year, it's going to probably have a very different strategy than the Onyx and God channel. But the Onyx and God channel, I plan on emulating the strategy more of what Fred Lamb is doing, what Rita Bonsi is doing with Flying Start Online, and being an educator. So those are the three models. Which one will work for you if you want to do YouTube organic? Is it going to be the vlogger? Is it going to be the mainstream insp inspirational or you know fun person to watch on fun topics? Or is it going to be the educator? For me, it's the educator. There's no right or wrong here. Each one has its own pluses and minuses. I can tell you right now, if you're a vlogger, um, I, I mean, I guess you'll build a really, really tight knit group of followers. I, I don't really know how you would monetize that. And so I just don't know enough about vlogging, but I'm sure there are some benefits. Um, I only see the negatives because I just don't like that model. <laughs> Number two, the mainstream inspirational, like Dan Locke style. I mean, you're going to rapid hack and build your subscriber base super fast, right? Like you, that, that's like mainstream getting out there, building people and more people into your net. And so the fame aspect is, is going to be definitely there. I guess the downside technically a little bit is that that audience isn't nearly as engaged with you or isn't as targeted, but the educator, your channel will grow slower. But man, them, those people are going to love you. And the shelf life of your videos will be years, not days. And so if you can stay to that strategy for week after week, after week, after week, after week, can you imagine like six months from now, a year from now, whatever, you will be bringing in so many highly targeted leads um, organically, passively. I love that. I love the idea of that. So that's the strategy change we're going to have. So a year later, I'm very excited about YouTube organic. I love it. I love the added benefit of the drop in ad cost, but the warm audiences, I just need to change my strategy and you'll start seeing us do that here in the next couple of weeks. All right, go out there. Come on, kick some butt. This has been the fighting entrepreneur podcast episode. Make sure you go to onicpodcast.com. Listen to all of our past episodes. Binge 
All right, binge. And make sure you go to iTunes and leave us a great review, please. It always helps us a lot. Go to any of the platforms you listen on. Leave us a great review. Make sure you tell everybody you know, including your grandma and your grandpa, about The Fighting Entrepreneur. All right, let's all come together. Listen, more than ever now, we can see our governments are absolutely not capable of helping us change the world. We have to do it ourselves. So at Learn, I'm going to put 10 million entrepreneurs into one place, and we're all going to help each other all over the world change the world. Go to lurn.com, join, get your free membership, be a part of this revolution. Don't stand on the sidelines and watch it go right by you. This is Onyx God reminding you, when life pushes you, stand, stand straight. Oh, let's try that again. 2020, I got to get it right. When life pushes you, stand straight, smile, and push it the heck back. I'll see you inside Learn, lurn.com. Go to onyxpodcast.com, leave us a great review, binge our other episodes. Until next time, go out there and fight for your dreams. Thanks for listening to The Fighting Entrepreneur with your host, Onyx Singal.